First Timothy 3. We're going to be looking today at verses 1 through 7. So allow me to read to you 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 7, and we'll get into our, into our study. What we're looking at in chapter 3 are what are called qualifications for pastoral leadership. And you'll see that in uh, verses 1 through 7. Beginning at verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, you fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest you fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, why would Paul outline these qualifications for church leaders? He intends to instruct Timothy concerning the kinds of men who should lead. You see, the church is a spiritual organization and needs spiritually mature leaders. So the list that he's going to give is going to serve as an outline to outline their spiritual qualifications, and that's to safeguard the church from doctrinal error as well as unholy living. So in outlining these character traits, he exposes unqualified leaders. In the case of the church of Ephesus, these leaders have already begun to infect the church. What have they done? Well, we've seen up to this point a few things. In chapter 1, verse 3, we've seen that they have introduced bad doctrine. And in chapter 1, verse 6, we saw that they spout worthless words where Jesus is not the center. You see, Bible studies that are not centered on Jesus Christ are spiritually without value. You need to remember that. And Paul made that clear when he was writing to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, he said this. He said, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So he, he was already pointing out that true Bible teaching will always center on Jesus Christ. The gospel message is not to be tainted by man's philosophy, beautified by men's efforts, crafted to give glory to men, devoid of the centrality of the cross, changed to make Jesus acceptable to people, or emptied of the power of the Spirit to convict and to transform. And so he's sharing concerning that. He also has pointed out that they have misunderstood the law, and they've misunderstood the gospel. You saw that in chapter 1, verses 7 through 11. And then finally, it seems that they have placed women in pastoral positions, and you see that in chapter 2, verse 12, when he had said, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And so he's dealing with these things in the church. And he's instructing Timothy concerning leadership in the body of Christ. The church has been called an organized organism. You have what is called the church invisible, which is made up of all believers throughout all history. But you also have what is called the church visible the church today that exists throughout the world. And that would include a specific group of believers that are located in the same fellowship, and they would call that the local fellowship. And so in the local fellowship, there is a system of biblical authority. We know that Timothy is the pastor of the church in Ephesus, so Paul is giving him commands. He says in 1 Timothy 3.15, 
I write, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. For the church to be properly led, the elders and the deacons are the ones who direct the spiritual affairs. And the church is not led by, uh, by vote. It is led by elders and deacons who are to direct the spiritual affairs. The church is led by Scripture and the Holy Spirit. And so you have elders and deacons who serve in that position. When he speaks in verse 1 of bishop, notice that word bishop. He says, if a man desires the position of a bishop. That word bishop is a Greek word, episcope. It means overseer. Uh, it speaks of an office of an elder. He speaks of the deacon, diakonos. It's a table waiter, one who serves food and drink. Paul is speaking about the leaders in the church, and he's speaking about the qualifications of those who lead in the church. And I want you to notice, as we go through this, all of the qualifications that are listed are spiritual in nature. He's not concerned with the day-to-day -day duties so much as the spiritual character. You see, the church is spiritual in nature, and it needs to be led by the spiritually mature, because ungodly leaders do much harm for the cause of Christ. So here he outlines qualities or qualifications of eldership. He's really writing on what we would call the qualities of a godly man. And so he begins here in chapter 3, verse 1, by saying, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good thing. So notice with me, he says, this is a faithful saying. It's interesting how Paul likes that phrase. He uses the term faithful saying three times in 1 Timothy and two times in 2 Timothy. We saw it in chapter 1, verse 15, when he had said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He uses it again in chapter 4, verse 9, when he says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. In other words, in regarding to uh, exercising yourself to godliness. So that communicates that what is being said is weighty and must be remembered. So what must be remembered and what must be understood? And this is what he's saying. The desire for the difficult and strenuous work in the church is a noble one. For the office of elder is honorable. And in those days it meant harsh and ceaseless work as well as grave and constant danger. So his thought is, well might a man desire the office of chief pastor. It was indeed a good work. Such a dignity could only be held by one possessing many qualities. So let's look at what those qualities are. First, he said, church leadership as a pastor elder is reserved for a man. Notice verse 1, if a man desires the position of a bishop. He already stated that, that a woman was not to teach or hold authority over a man. That means that pastoral roles are reserved for men. Secondly, he says, if a man desires, desires. The word desire means to stretch out. It's as if you're stretching out to grasp something. It carries the connotation of passionately setting your heart upon something. So if you have a you know, I may be speaking to somebody in this room right now who feels a call to ministry, so you may want to keep these things in mind. Uh, one of the evidences of a calling to leadership is a godly desire to serve in that capacity. You see, there are those who enter into ministry as a job, or they enter into ministry thinking they'll make some money. There are those who enter into pastoral leadership for prestige, and there are others who make it a, what we would call a second career. But that's not the proper reason to pursue full-time ministry. Pastoral leadership is a calling that is put on your heart by God. God places this into your heart when he has called you to lead. And he's the one who calls you. In John 15, 16, Jesus said it like this. He said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Pastors can be trained by colleges and they can be trained by seminaries, but they're gifted by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 20, verse 28, Paul said, Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So serving as an elder in the church isn't a job, and it's not a carnal aspiration. It is a spirit-inspired call to lead that cannot, cannot be satisfied doing anything else. 
Charles Spurgeon once said, I always say to young fellows who consult me about the ministry, don't be a minister if you can help it. Because if the man can help it, God never called him. But if he cannot help it, and he must preach or die, then he is the man. In Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9, Jeremiah writes, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. If a man has an internal desire to go out and do the work of ministry, that is a calling from God who has placed that on that person's heart. It's not because they can't find a job doing something else. It's not because they like just to talk. It's not because they're eloquent or intellectual. Those things are all good and they go along with the package sometimes. But the initial thing is a relationship with God. The initial call is the desire to take what God has given to them and to give it to others. And he desires this and he wants this because God has placed this on his heart. And he says the desire for the position of overseer or bishop is a good or a noble thing. He doesn't take it lightly because it's a noble work carrying great responsibility. Because when somebody goes into ministry, they are influencing people not only for the now, but forever. When you're in ministry and you're giving the word to people and sharing with them the things of God, there needs to be a healthy sense of the fear of the Lord in you because what you're doing is not just affecting them for right now. They will carry those things for the rest of their life. James 3 verse 1 says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. See, ultimately, as a pastor, I give an account of my ministry to the Lord. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you, be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So this fear of the Lord is to be present in anyone that is placed in leadership. And when you look at this, when he says, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good or a noble work, he begins to share concerning the qualifications. And I want you to notice with me that these qualifications really are revealing a person's character. Let's look at them individually. Verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless. The word blameless speaks of a spotless character. They need to be above reproach. Blameless speaks of one against whom it is impossible to bring any charge of wrongdoing such as could stand impartial judgment. It speaks of being morally upright, one who can be a moral and spiritual model worthy of imitation and can stand the scrutiny of Christians as well as the outside community. He's to be of spotless character. He's to be a person who can say what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You see, in many places, this high standard has been reduced if the person who's pastoring is liked by the congregation. We need to be aware of the fact that somebody with a winsome personality doesn't necessarily make them a pastor. He speaks, secondly, of the husband, notice, of one wife. When he says the bishop is to be the husband of one wife, it has been translated a one-woman man. In other words, for him there is only one woman, and he desires her alone. He values, he cherishes, and he looks at her as the only one for him. You see, in the midst of loosened sexual morals, the elder is to have Christ-like love for his wife. That permits him to minister to women with without indiscretions. It serves as an example to the church. Believe it or not, most pastors, many pastors, are actually, are actually, um, what's the word? They, became, they, become, they can become 
attractive to women in the church. They can be as ugly as a toad. And there'll be somebody who's after him. And, and that's just the truth. And I, I won't go into long detail about this. It's just the truth. And so as a pastor, it is of utmost importance for that person to have, one, an inner desire to please the Lord. If he desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing, an inner desire that God has placed in his heart to do a noble work. That noble work is tied in with a healthy fear of God and awareness of the responsibilities that they hold. Thus, they do not desire to be a teacher simply because they like to speak or because they want to influence people or, or, or get money and prestige from that. But they do it because there's nothing else they can do. And when they have a relationship with the Lord that that prompts them in that inner desire to do that, then what they want to do is live a life that lines up with the, uh, with the, with, with the, the beauty of the gospel. And part of that would mean that in their marital relationship, that there's only one woman on the face of the earth that they, de they desire because that safeguards them when they do ministry and women will approach them, and sometimes they do, and they make themselves available to that pastor, which has happened even to me several times in, in the years that I've ministered. Awkward times where, where people have made themselves available to me. And so if you're not a man who loves that woman, your woman, and there's no other woman except that woman, you can fall into dis indiscretion because there are those who are very open in their desire to take you away from your wife. And yes, that's happened here more than once. Someone said, Paul, fully conscious of the low and debased moral tone which then pervaded all society in the empire, in these few words, condemned all illicit relations between the sexes and directed that in choosing persons to fill holy offices in the congregations of Christians, those should be selected who had married and remained faithful to the wife of their choice, whose life and practice would thus serve as an example to the flock. He needs to be a one-woman man. He needs to be the kind of man that only sees the one woman. And so he's, when he says this, he must be the husband of one wife, he's not saying the husband of one wife at a time. He's saying the husband of one wife. There's only one woman in his life that has won his heart because that causes him in his fear of the Lord to remain faithful not only to his wife, but to the church. A third thing, he is to be temperate. He is to be self-restrained. He waits on the Lord. He doesn't react emotionally, and he doesn't react impulsively. In, in Proverbs 29, 11, a fool vents all his feelings. A wise man holds them back. So he's to be temperate. Fourth, He's to be sober-minded. The word sober-minded means self-controlled. Uh, he's calm and he's wise. He's not given to rash actions. He makes decisions prayerfully and he does so patiently. Proverbs 18:13 says, "He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and a shame to him. A sober-minded man listens and is self-controlled. A fifth thing, he's of good behavior. The word good behavior speaks of being honorable or dignified. He is one who is respectable and has earned the respect of people. His conduct in all ways reflects the dignity of the office. So when you meet him, regardless of whether it's in the church during the service or after the service, or you see him in Costco or a restaurant or on a ball field watching his children play, He's the same person. He doesn't put on the pastor role when he stands on the platform and the ordinary guy role when he's in the community. He is always aware of who he is. He's a person who is dignified. Sixth, he's hospitable. The word hospitable literally speaks of a love of strangers. In other words, he makes people feel welcome. He obviously loves people. He cares about them because people matter. In 3 John, John gives an example of a bad elder, one by the name of Diotrephes. In 3 John, verses 9 and 10, 
John says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So a bishop is to be hospitable. He's the person, uh, and the word bishop, we use that now sometimes in church hierarchy. The word bishop was really the word that could be used for pastor and elder overseer. Uh, he makes you feel welcome. He makes you feel like you belong. A seventh thing, he's apt or able to teach. He's anointed by the Holy Spirit to practically explain as well as to apply scripture. He's to be diligent in his study and he's to practice what he preaches. Paul could say it like this in Philippians 4 verse 9. He said, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the God of peace will be with you. So as a teacher, he makes sure that he's teaching God's word to the people. Church services are to center on the communication of the word of God. There are a lot of places today that that's not so. But church services are to center on the word of God, the communication of it and the application. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But there are large congregations that are led by those who do not do this. I believe that this requirement to be a teacher of the word of God has been largely ignored, especially if the church is growing. A.W. Tozer once said, there was a time when people went to church, heard the truth, and wept over their sins. Today, people go to church, hear a motivational speech, and ignore their sins. And that's true. That's true. This is a man who feels that the word of God should be the center of everything that church believes. In verse 3, he says, not given to wine. That's an interesting phrase, not given to wine. It literally is not lingering at the cup, not addicted to wine. Not only does he not drink, he is also not associated with drinking. He doesn't start what has been called a beer and Bible study. There have been plenty of those even in, in, our, in our area. They call them beer and Bible studies where the pastor has people over uh, in a cafe, a bar. They open up the Bible, they drink their suds, their beer, and uh, that's what they do. He's not associated with drinking. I remember when our church was new, uh, somebody approached me and they had a question of me and they said, listen, I need to ask you a question because I'm starting to come here, but I was going someplace else and, and I just want to know what, what your, your take on this is. And I said, well, what is it you're concerned about? And they said, well, on New Year's Eve, the pastor invited select members of the church whom he referred to as the more spiritually mature to come to his house for a New Year's Eve service. So we went because we were invited. And while we were there, he was the bartender and he was serving drinks to all of the people that he invited. And I just want to know whether that's right or wrong because I felt that it was wrong. Well, it's wrong. The pastor is not to be given to wine. He's not to be associated with drink. And in doing so, he's, he's, if he is given to drink, he's revealing that he's not wise and unqualified. In Proverbs 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Ninth, he's not violent. He's not a brawler. <laughs> that may be because he lingers too much at the cup. I don't know. He gets drunk and he hits people. But what it literally speaks of is he is not intimidating to people. He controls his temper. In ministry, 99% of the church comes and then leaves immediately. A few may st stay afterwards and visit. So while everybody else is gone, on occasion there are those who linger, who actually try to start problems. And I've, I've had people after Bible studies more than once who have 
wanted to start a problem with me after church. They're usually my elders, but <laughs> once in a while it's Marie. And so, but they do. I, I've, had, I've had them come up uh, and uh, tell me that, that God has told them to smite me. I've gotten letters saying, um, tell Rosales to be careful because, you know, I'm carrying a gun and, and stuff like that. And, um, and I've had people get in my face, you know, get very aggressive. And, and a, a minister is not to be a brawler. He, he's not to be somebody who responds to aggravation like that, where, where, where suddenly he takes the gloves off and just, just hammers somebody. He, he's not to be that way. You know, he's, he's to have a, 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 a compassionate spirit and not, not given to violence. Because again, when, when you're on the outside and you're looking in, you don't know what's going on in. You just have your idea of what may be, but you don't know. I, I remember I had a guy in this fellowship. I'll give you one, one story. Uh, there was a guy in this fellowship. He was a big guy. You, you know, I'm not a big man by any means. And he was, uh, he was 6'2 or so, at least 6'2. And he weighed probably 260 to, to 280 at least. He was a lot bigger. And, and he was playing on a basketball team. This is over 30 years ago, so I can say it now. And, um, and he, he was playing on one of our basketball teams, and he caused problems. And so the coach said to him, you know, you really can't be on the team because it brings out the worst in you. You're, you're constantly causing struggles and quarrels on the court. This is obviously not good for you, so we're going to have to remove you from the team. And, and this guy was a big guy, very, very much a bully. I mean, on one occasion, uh, he got mad at his wife in the church, and he slammed this metal door that we had so hard it caused the whole building to shake. He banged out the door. I mean, this guy had a real volatile temper, and, and he approaches me when he was removed from the, from the basketball team. And, he's, and, and he was very gentle. He was speaking to me with a very soft voice. He says, Pastor, may I speak to you? And I said, of course. He says, can we go into a room by ourselves? I said, no. <laughs> You're going to use me as a basketball. Nope. <laughs> They'll find me all crumbled up in a corner. I said, no. No. If you have anything you need to speak to me about, this is a great place to do it. There has to be some wisdom in this, but you also have to be a person who is not prone to violence. You have to be. Because there are people who have such need that sometimes they're angry and they take it out on you. And not only that, you don't have to be a big person to be an intimidating person. So you have to be aware of how you deal with people, how you speak to them, how you treat them because you can intimidate them just by the power of the office. And so he says, be aware of that. This is a person who controls his temper and is not intimidating to others. Proverbs 16, 32 says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes the city. And he goes on in verse three to say, he is not greedy for money. It's eager for base gain. The love for and the longing for money is a motivator for many a false teacher. Titus 1.11 speaks of false teachers whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole, whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, Peter, speaking of false teachers, said, By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. You see, a genuine shepherd is to serve without greed. Like it says in 1 Peter 5, 2, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. So you don't put yourself in a position where you are attempting to make money and riches off of congregations. You don't do that. You don't serve for that reason. You serve because you want to, with purity, encourage people to know the Lord. He gives another qualification. He said he is to be gentle. 
The word gentle speaks of a sweet reasonableness. It speaks of being gracious and kindly. It speaks of being forgiving. You see, false teachers often bully and abuse. They often control and hurt the sheep. Paul was outraged because that took place in Corinth. And he even writes to the Corinthians and he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, he said to them, you gladly put up with fools since you are so wise. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or pushes himself forward or slaps you in the face. In contrast, a genuine pastor or elder is gentle. He's one who doesn't insist that he's always right. He's ready to yield in some degree for the sake of peace. A twelfth thing is he's not quarrelsome. He's a non-combatant. He's not always picking arguments and trying to create, create strife and, and proving his point. 2 Timothy 2.24 the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach and patient. See, whenever I teach, there is always somebody who disagrees. That's, that's normal. And if they come up, which on occasion they do, and want to debate a point or whatever, or write me, Facebook is a great place for people to hide behind a keyboard and, and tell you what they think. Uh, I just dealt with that this morning. I mean, it happens all the time. Um, you have to be very careful that you don't always look to pick an argument with somebody. When, when a pastor's teaching the word of God, Jesus said it like this. He said, it is the spirit of your father that speaks in you, through you. And so the bottom line is, is if the word is rightly divided and it's being presented properly, then you simply let the word defend itself. And if people want to argue, which on occasion they do, the best that you can do is to try and patiently encourage them to see these things and ask questions. You know, because there'll be times that people have approached and I'll, they'll say something and I'll say, were you here just now? Yes, I was. Because okay. sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's one service and they're just arriving for another one. So I'll say, were you here? Yes, I was. Okay, did you hear this? Yes. Did you hear this, this? Oh, I see. That's what you meant? Yes. So you're not there to argue. You're there to point out what the point really is. So you're not there to argue, you're a non-combatant. Thirteenth, not covetous. Well, when he speaks like that, not covetous, he, he's, he's saying uh, he's not shopping around for better pay. Uh, the pay that he receives is not what motivates his service to the Lord or the church. In Acts 20, verse 33, Paul said, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. This is somebody who lives by faith. He trusts the Lord to supply his need. Many years ago, there was somebody that I, I, I knew well enough for him to speak to me in this way, and, and he asked me, and his fellowship is, is, a, is a large fellowship, much larger than ours, and he asked me a question once. He said, Dave, have you ever thought of, of trading churches where I would take over his and he would take over mine? And his fellowship um, probably, and he's in another state, and I'll leave him unnamed, but he, his fellowship was quite a, lot, quite, a, quite a bit larger than our fellowship. And I remember smiling at him and saying, no, of course not. No, I've never thought of that. You know, pastors are not supposed to be trying to trade up. You know, trying, okay, I make this much here, so if I go here, I'll make this much there, and then if I go here, I'll make that much there. You know, it's, it's not a ladder that you climb. And you don't do it for ministry. And you're not covetous of other things. You just, uh, you just are blessed to be where you're at. In verses 4 and 5, he, he says he rules his own house well, which means he manages his family properly. His children are trained to be respectful and obedient. That helps to reveal his priorities being correct. Now, one of the things that we're aware of is, is that he cannot make his children believers, but there is evidence that he's done his best to evangelize and raise them in the ways of the Lord. It's not that the pastor will have a perfect family. Every child grows to the point where they have to make the decision up for themselves whether they're going to follow Christ or not. The key is, did that pastor neglect them? Did that pastor not train them up? Did that pastor not do his best? 
And ultimately, that's what you look at. His children are to be people of faith, but he only can stir it and encourage it. They ultimately are going to make the decision on their own. He says in verse 6, not a novice, not a new convert, not one who's undeveloped in faith. Why? Because he can become puffed up. That word puffed up speaks of being clouded or even deluded. He's saying a, a, a convert, a new convert who becomes a leader can be deluded by pride. And pride causes him to become blinded by the authority that they have, by the power that they receive. And he will fall. You know, I'll be honest with you, and I don't know if this makes it, this probably won't. But I, I say it on occasion, forgive me, you may have heard this before. You won't believe this, but it's true. More than I can count, I've had people, I, I can only count to four, but very often, very often, I'll put it that way, without hyperbole. Very often over the years, I have had people speak into me after a service or someplace else. You know, I run into them in a store in the area or whatever. And, and you won't believe this. And I'm saying this for a reason. I'll get there in a moment. They are literally shaking. Their bodies will shake. They're so nervous. And I'll look at them and, I'll, and they'll say, Pastor David, can I... Take, can I take your time for a moment? And I'll say, you're not taking anything. I'm giving you it. What you, I just want, and they'll start, and I'll say, how come you're so nervous? Well, because I'm talking to you. And I say, oh, please don't do that. Please don't do that. You know, I'm your brother. I'm your brother. I remember my own Pastor Chuck Smith. I was speaking to him years ago now. And as I was speaking to him, Pastor Chuck was, some of you may remember him. Some of you grew up under him. Pastor Chuck was a very, very well-known pastor throughout the world. Very well-known. Invited by the president of his, in, in, in Regan and others who wanted him to go and advise and this and that in the White House. And, and he said, no. He said, my job is to minister to my sheep and to, to pastor my church. That's what I'm called to do. Not to become some advisor to, to um, others, but to care for my own. And I, I loved him for that. He was very famous, though. He was very well-known. And uh, I was speaking to him on one occasion, and, and I said, Pastor, blah, blah, blah. And at that point, he said, Dave, always remember I'm your brother. Remember I'm your brother. I remember the first time I had a real conversation with my pastor, how the Lord taught me that. Th this is a man who is just a man, just like you. Admire the work that God has done, but admire the God who's done that work. And so in our relationship here, you know, I don't know how long you're called to be here. You, you may leave today, and I may never see you again, but you may be someone who's been for years in this fellowship. Always remember one thing. I'm your brother, you know, and I love you. And no, you're not taking time for me. When I'm in restaurants, and I, I, on occasion, somebody will approach me, I don't want to take your time. I'll always say the same thing. You're not taking my time. I'm giving it to you. But I'll also give you my bill so you can pay for me. How's that sound? <laughs> Because we're brothers, and, and, and oh, we're, we, we don't walk on water, you know? Uh, I, I, you know, if I step off of this platform, I am going to hit the ground. I'm not going to levitate. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Now, I don't have to tell most of you. I don't have to tell pretty much, and maybe I don't have to tell any of you this, but there's always at least one or two who are intimidated, and I'm telling you, please don't be. Please don't be. Because we're family in Christ. We belong to one another. It's the body of Christ. You know, and, and, a, and a minister needs to understand that. He's not some special person in the church. He's a member of the church who has responsibilities within the church. And hopefully he does them well. And hopefully these things apply to him. But he's not someone who's puffed up. He's not deluded. He's not blinded by his authority. He's not blinded by his 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 power. He, he's a person who is simply there to serve. Remember that pride is the sin that turned angels into devils. In Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Seven, uh, verse 7, a 16th thing, he must have a good testimony. 
a good testimony. Verse 7, moreover, you must have a good testimony among those who are outside, who aren't Christians. In other words, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Someone said, no minister of the gospel can possibly do unbelieving people good unless they regard him as an upright and honest man. And that is so true. Because people who are well-known have failed. All of us, all pastors, have gotten a black eye. You have thousands of, of people who love the Lord, multiple thousands, over 500,000 people in the United States are ordained pastors, over 500,000. And yet, you'll hear about one person over here or one person over there that failed, and I receive I received the criticism that fell on them. They will say things to me as if I have lied, as if I have gone out on my wife. They do. I've had this happen so many times. Oh, you pastors are all thieves. I remember a guy telling me that. You guys are all thieves. He has to have a good testimony amongst non-believers. Even if they don't agree with him, they ought to respect him. Even if they reject what he's saying, they ought to respect the fact that he believes that. Because bad leaders bring the church into disrepute. So that's why it's important for me as a, as a pastor to remember who I am at all times. Within my home, and outside of it. And again, you could speak to my children and you could ask them, does your father live the same way in the home as he does in the, in the pulpit? And they will tell you that I do. Why? Because a pastor is not what I play at. A pastor is who I am. It's what I do. It's my personhood. This is what I am called to do. So why would I put something on here that I don't live at home. He said he can fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. By failing to live out the gospel, he falls into the trap laid for him by the devil. If he fails, it causes the whole message to look powerless to change lives. And for this reason, Timothy, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. You see, genuine elders are to have the habit of safeguarding the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3, Paul said it like this, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. We preach a message of transformation. And if you have a heart to be a leader, if you have a heart to one day be a pastor, young man, look at these qualifications and pray that God will make you into this. And what's interesting about this and if you look at it closely for one more moment, all of the things you see here should apply to every believer, to be honest with you. Every believer. Every one of us in this room, from a male or, pers or female perspective, should have this. We should be blameless. We should love our husband or wife if you're married. We should be temperate, sober-minded, good behavior, hospitable. We should be able to share not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. We should be gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. We ought to rule our own house well. And we ought to be careful to mature. These are all things you can apply to yourself today. Even if you're not called to be a pastor, may God form that character in us as believers.